With us we have tonight uh, Jack and Mary Rowan and Frank Holman, who are going to uh, provide, I hope, some input, well, I understand some input, on some areas of the occult with relation to suicide. I guess the best way to begin is to introduce the panelists and allow them to uh, make any introductory statements they might care to make. This is Frank Holman, Jack, Rowan, Mary Rowan. Okay. And, uh, I don't know who wants to begin. Why don't we let ladies first? Oh, okay. that's a cop out. <laughs> 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 well, we've sort of, uh, I guess, been real nosy people, curious. We had to find out many, many things, uh, maybe because of need of our family. We had family problems, and uh, suicide was involved in this. Um, uh, people desiring to commit suicide and we're wondering why and would it happen and so forth. So some of the tools we've used to probe for information to help our family, ourselves, and eventually other people uh, were like uh, handwriting analysis. Uh, we got into hypnosis, ESP, uh, what is life and death like, why, why are we here, <clears throat> what happens when we die, what is it like on the other side or is there another side, is there a life hereafter. So these are some of the things that we've probed into, and so if you want to uh, ask any questions, we'll maybe take it from there. Um, you two have anything to say? Well, <clears throat> uh, they didn't mention it, but we're hypnotists, uh, and that's what we wanted to stress is how we can use hypnosis to, to help prevent suicides, to get into the subconscious mind with hypnosis and find out why they want to commit suicide and kind of nudge them into another, another train of thought change their attitude. Where, where do these attitudes come from? You can use that in under hypnosis. You can remember anything that's ever happened to you in this life. Uh, any thought you've ever had almost, any smell or taste or anything is all put into that subconscious mind of ours. And so through hypnosis we can learn to regress you back to a certain age and find out what triggered or why do you have this mental block or this hang up that you're uh, wanting to do away with yourself why you can't cope with your problems and through this kind of therapy that we can help you or help help you help yourself because there's really no thing as applied hypnosis you hypnotize yourself always always remember you hypnotize yourself when you go to a hypnotist he just there to, as a guide well I don't know uh... I think, you know, Mary was mentioning about going the other side. I'm primarily a handwriting analyst, but uh, I've gotten into a lot of these things with Jack and Mary. And one of the things that I think has impressed me the most is that suicide seems to come mostly from a stress of not knowing or lack of direction. A person has no direction, therefore they don't want to live. They're confused, maybe, as to why they're here. And some of the things that we've gotten into, we feel we found reasons. We found answers to some of the age-old questions of why life at all, why death, what is death. And I really, I don't know. That's, you know, I'd have a statement. If somebody starts some discussion. Somebody has some interesting questions or arguments. Could not, could not suicide come from uh negative stuff in this class. The one who's received negative stroke and they come, they come to find out the only way they can be stroked is through negative stroke. And they do this to get their stroke, but also it is annoying to the person himself because he is doing wrong, he knows he's doing wrong. And he would like to do something right, but the subconscious is driving him to do the wrong. Well, the situation I think that you're, you've put here, of course, this is attempted suicide. No, no, I'm not talking about in the point of suicide yet. I'm talking about driving to the point of suicide. That eventually, as the subconscious is rebelling against doing the wrong, and the conscious is doing wrong because it gets stroking for doing wrong, but no stroking for doing right. Can I ask you a question? The subconscious is battling against it, and then the pressure becomes too great. And then he says, wow, why should I even be here? And then he will either attempt or commit suicide. 
You talk about right and wrong. By whose judgment is he doing that wrong? That is by the person that has programmed him or raised him right. or the standards that he's been put into his head. Right. And until a person can overcome this, they have to learn how to handle this problem. Right. Mm -hmm. Because is there any right or wrong? I mean, we are here to learn things. Right and wrong is governed by the money power and the big people of the society. Right. Mm -hmm. So to program someone, this is wrong, this is wrong, you did wrong. Who's to judge that he did wrong? Maybe these are learning situations in his life to learn better things. To prevent suicide mm -hmm. or to prevent is to, to convince a person that you do what you please because what you please is right as long as you are happy. Mm -hmm. and you have not hurt or harmed another human mm -hmm. being or this property. This is why I feel uh, uh, parents, uh, teachers, churches can program people full of guilt. You did this, this is wrong, you're a sinner, you're terrible, you're bad, you know, and then, oh, oh you know, they just give up. That's negative. I'm good for nothing. Mm -hmm. And they continue to do it to get stroking because they're a human being. Mm -hmm. Well, let's hope they can find someone that will set them on a, on a better track and get rid of their guilt. The thing that I think that uh, every human being can do to prevent suicides or, or the increase in the criminal field or all other things is to ignore what you consider wrong that another human being does and stroking vigorously for everything he does right, but do not stroke him for the wrong he did. Just mm -hmm. ignore it, forget about it, because that person knows he did wrong before you'll ever know he did. Mm -hmm. You're right, good point. Thank you. Also to that, you know, that the idea of negative stroking is mainly from that aspect of uh, would be like a contaminated adult by child, the child play. And positive stroking, since the person's already in a not okay position, wouldn't really help. Yes, positive stroking will help. Not until the person readjusts and get rid of the child uh, but contamination. Can, can a person readjust with negative stroking? No, he can't no. readjust that way. But also, but, you've got to give him more help than just positive stroking. It's got to be an understanding and a drawing out of the contamination stroking? that's been caused. Let me ask you, what is positive stroking? What is positive stroking? Well, that's from a non-contaminated adult. Psychological, physical, either way, both. Oh. Are stroking. I can right. give you positive stroking psychologically without ever saying a word. Oh, that's true. I can give you physical positive stroking by giving you a helping hand. Right. Saying, wow, this is beautiful. Mm. So but beautiful, if a person let me join you. Okay, okay, maybe we just have a misunderstanding here, but what I'm saying is if you run across a person who is in a not okay position who requires negative stroking, you can give them a helping hand to be totally rejected. Therefore, you have to bring about the opposite reaction. Now, wait a minute. Let, let, let me bring a point out right here. If I was to run around trying to determine from my own mind who I should give positive or negative or any other stroking to, being I am not perfect and no other human is, then I would make a mistake. Right. right. <laughs> okay. So if I give positive stroking psychologically and physically to every human being I see, then I have better society because if one out of every hundred turns out to the better, then that's one that could have been the other way. Take the ones that don't take it because the ones that do could have been with the ones that didn't. You have not been positive stroking. Oh, I agree with you perfectly there. And so, to myself, from my point of view, I believe positive stroking is the only thing that can help out. Through positive stroking and positive stroking only will we better society. Because if you give it out, then the people that you have given it to, even though they can't do it all the time, they will grow into giving positive stroking. And it starts a chain reaction that will eventually, days, months, years, or centuries, then whole society will be giving positive stroke. And then we will have a society that is running in harmony. And the only way you can have suicide is with conflict. Once you have harmony, is What role, I wonder? 
does the evolution, does reincarnation play in the evolution of society? And in that context, how does suicide, as a choice of self distinction, govern the individual? Uh, I feel that uh, if a person has committed suicide in a past life, they're apt to do it again. I've seen this in people. Uh, we found out by regressing people uh, under hypnosis into past lives, finding out they did commit suicide. Uh, psychic readers have picked this up on people also, so we have double checked. Palm readers can look at their palm and somehow tell they have committed suicide in past life. So we've like double checked in different ways. And these are the people that seem to have a tendency as soon as the chips are down, they want to cop out again. They want to get out. So these are the ones that tend to do it. Okay, now, as far as the next life is concerned, if you do commit suicide, you drop your body. Uh, I feel a body is only a vehicle. There really is no death. You destroy your body, you're still here, but you're in confusion. So if you kill yourself, you lose your body, and all of a sudden, what happened? You w wouldn't realize that you did succeed in killing yourself and that now your body is dead and here I am on another plane. So you may not know this and you'll be in confusion for a while and in complete misery from what I understand. And uh, as time passes, you will sort of come out of this not knowing. You will have unseen beings, unseen to us, help you and guide you on. But you've done uh, quite a terrible injustice to yourself, whereas it is going to uh, make a lot of work for you on that other plane that you could have more easily done here with this vehicle, this body. Uh, it'll possibly take you more time to reincarnate again, to pick up another body and come back again. So you're slowing your progress. Uh, I believe, personally, that the idea is you live life after life to complete certain lessons so that you can get up to the source from where we came. To my opinion, the source uh, is a ball of energy. We're all a small ball of energy, and we want to go back to the source from where we came. And this will take us longer if we commit suicide. We're just slowing the progress toward complete happiness, merging with the source, or which most people would call God. Along with what she's saying, what she says is, is I agree with it, but I have other points I would like to bring out of this. Is that the body is a vehicle, as she said, because it only transports my mind around through this world. How many times my mind has been in this world and how many times it will come again, I do not know. But as most human beings believe in a God, a superior power, regardless of what you call him, God, Mohammed, Buddha, regardless, there is one. A heaven and a hell, hell I am, because I must live in hell, this world, and I must work my way to heaven. I will continue to be reincarnated back into this hell until I have reached the grave that the Spirit of Power says is satisfactory that I can be gone to heaven. What is heaven? What is right and what is wrong? All things in this world we can find all things. But the only place we can find fault from is, is from our own mind. So our mind must have been somewhere where all things are perfect. Because you must know something better before you can judge something as bad, wrong, default, or vice versa. When our mind is separated from our body in dreams, or just map and forget about our body in thinking, it is a beautiful, it is a taste of heaven. But all temptations, sins of man is caused by the body, not his food. The body wants food, clothes, sex, all these other senses of the body are the temptations to the mind. They rip the mind from this heaven, separated from the body, back to reality to the temptations, he wants gold, clothes, all these things. So when you have died your final death in life, your mind is separated from your body, and it is set up to it to its heaven, where it came from, where it was created. 
What I wonder though is. Those are just what I said. Aren't you just repeating what I said? That's what I said. Fine. And I wanted okay. to say it a different way. Okay. Uh, are many people involved in the <coughs> inquiry um, that convinced, that didactic, that dualistic, you know, that, that uh, totally uh, opposed the system? Now, this is a traditional strategy. We must be thinking of probably division between flesh and spirit. And I wonder, you know, do you share that kind of a world view? I think what text implied is that there was a fall to find a Christian view. We're involved in a climb up. You don't understand? No, I don't. I guess we didn't understand. Could you tell us again? I didn't hear you too well either. Yeah, <laughs> kind of hard to hear you. Do you want to sit up? Do you think or? that, um, do you agree in substance? The text said that there is that d division between mind and body, oh. and that that's that's yep. the uh, source of the conflict that people are evolving through. Oh, I feel the body is quite an unimportant thing, in my opinion, just a, a physical thing. Like uh, you're driving around in your car, and it's pretty handy to have. But if you lose it, you're going to have to walk and make it more difficult. And so we lose our body, and things are a little more, bit more difficult. But I don't th think it's all that important. But if it's un if it's unimportant. <clears throat> That's not the same as saying that it's necessarily negative. No, no. No, it's a no, very this positive is, point. I, I don't agree with him. He's going on about what's right and wrong and and uh, things of the body and so forth. I think you're judging, again, in my opinion, you're judging what's right and wrong. Who's to say there's anything wrong or you, you're to decide what's right and wrong? I am saying all of my temptations. I am a book, and I'm reading to you from me. I am not saying what I am saying is right or wrong, <coughs> mm -hmm. but, but I am reading to you from me. I am a book, you are a book. The world is a library, and no two human beings are alike, and no two books in a library are alike. Well, what, one, of the main thing, one of the main things that we'd like to get to here is the fact that, okay, we have this vehicle, this body. The separation from it does not say that we are nothing then except energy there is a feeling that there are more bodies on different levels. The body, or heaven or hell, or whatever you want to call it, is something that a person or an individual can make. It's not something you fall into or get out of. It's you make it. You can make this heaven if you want to. Things of the body can be overcome, not by willpower, not by saying, I'm not going to let myself fall to temptation, but by learning, becoming aware of more than what we have here and raising above them so that they do not create a temptation. You don't fight temptation. That doesn't stop it. It's still there. The only way you can get around that idea is by raising above it and by becoming conscious of more than what we have here. Just because after we die we're in a different phase or a different plane doesn't mean that we're restricted here. We can become conscious of these planes while we're in this body. We can even travel among these planes while we're in this body. So it's not a matter of what's right or wrong here or what's a temptation here. It's a matter of becoming aware of these things so that we know how to cope with them. Does anyone have a response to that? Please. A response? I'll be perfectly right. I, I think if we could get everybody else involved here too, and the occult is such a broad subject, and there are a lot of people here, and they must all have opinions and and questions. And there we go. Question about hypnosis. What are like, what can't you do with hypnosis if a person has problems in, in solving? Well, I don't. That's the well, there <clears throat> there are limitations to hypnosis. I mean, you can't cure uh, diseases with them. But you can cure, uh, like, uh, well, for instance, uh, uh, to relate to our own experience, we have, we've had people with, with eczema or uh, acne and things like this. The mind does such strange, strange things that if we're taught not to cry, for instance, as a child, you know, it's not, it's not good to cry, stop that crying. Well, then, if emotion comes up as our, in a, in a, when you're turning from a child to an adult, and you have to cry, but it's not polite. Well, the skin will cry for you then. And this is what causes your skin rashes. Really, it's the body crying. The mind affects, affects your body that way. And the mind, to my mind, the more I get into this, 
controls us right down to being susceptible to cancer or anything. I'm not saying there's no germs or anything that we can germ up. There are germs, but why do some people are more susceptible to them than others? I think the mind is what puts our body in that state to receive these germs and things like that. That puts us more uh, receptive. Some people go through life without a, a bit of problems, and then there's our other people that are sick all the time. And I think it's themselves that are making them sick. Well, that's not exactly what I hear. Mm -hmm. okay, not here. I'll Question is, you're, you're talking about I'm talking about cures? hypnosis as, okay, let's say, let, let's take uh, an example, let's say, of myself. I've got you know, problems yeah, that I wanted to see counselors about, for mm -hmm. example talk about, try to work out problems with myself, things I don't understand, why I do certain things certain ways that I'd like not to do. Um, if, if hypnosis is so good, why don't, why are the counselors, why aren't you just people that do that all the time? So that <laughs> That's a good question because it's, uh, it's such a great, I think it's the greatest tool and it's the fastest tool to change your way of thinking, but it does take time. And well, it's counseling does too. Mm -hmm. uh, right, uh, but to hypnotize you, like say you have some fear against it, and you might have to come back time and time again to be hypnotized to into that state. This is what I mean by taking time, to hypnotize you down into that state where you can get at the problem. And uh, of course you have to go and find out what the one-to-one uh, -one relationship with the hypnotherapist that uses it. Then he gives you testing, then the hour is and then you have to come back again because they're very busy and they're so rare. I've, and, I've never yeah. heard of that being suggested by... Well, you just haven't hit the ones that do it. There are some that do this, you know. But uh, I think there are fads like you read all the uh, old hypnosis books and so forth. And back in the 17, 1800s, I mean, this was the tool that was used. But then uh, anesthetic came and uh, then the uh, other methods that psychiatrists use now and so forth. And this is the fad. And shove a pill down <laughs> yeah, a person for it, psychiatrist's anesthesia. It's, yeah. it's the, the wonder it's, drugs that killed hypnosis and the anesthetic because that's all they had as a tool in the old days before they invented all these so-called wonder drugs. is all they had was the mind to work with. And they were getting so they could hypnotize a person for a major operation and they wouldn't feel a thing and they could take them right through the post-operative with hypnosis and cure them and heal it much faster with the mind. But now all of a sudden, but they were rare and there was too many people. Like I say, it takes time with this hypnosis. And everybody cannot be hypnotized the first time. Some I've read books where it took as high as 700 times to hypnotize one person to get them in that state. So you see, it, everybody is different. How much resistance do you put up with it? And this is why a lot of doctors don't have time. They can only spend maybe 30 minutes because they got a, a room full of people waiting and they have to work at least an hour with you. See, and most doctors you go to today, you go in and state your problem, he's got his little book out, he writes out something, goodbye, see me next week, and in comes another patient. And this is the way they have this big turnover, and they don't do you no good, they're just pill pushers is what they are. So in order to get a doctor that's really trained in it, there so far you've got to make months in advance. A doctor of hypnosis, mm -hmm. what kind of training? Uh... Listen, anybody can hypnotize. It doesn't take, all you've got to do is memorize the words. But it's what to do with the patient when you got them hypnotized. That's where the training comes in. You got to be an MD, a psychiatrist, a psychologist. You got to learn how to uh, handle the problems you do get, what to tell the person, what to look for, how to handle them. And this is why they're so rare because it takes all that training and to be. And where do you get the training? And where do you get the training? It's There's been very difficult. Yeah, where do you get it? Yeah. Well, you go. You can go to. Uh, There's certain schools that teach uh, the science of hypnosis. Hey, not here. This man wanted to know if hypnosis could help. Not here. This man wanted to know if hypnosis could help his sex drive. Sex drive? Yeah. Could they? Could they help him in any way? That's what he wants. Well, uh, increase it or decrease it or what? Uh, probably eliminate from being the problem. Oh. Well, I don't know. It. Uh... Why would he want to eliminate it? Don't you well, think it's a necessary thing? He has the problem. And yeah. You, you understand where he's at, and uh -huh. what his problems might be. 
I don't think we could make a blank statement on that because we'd have to sit with a person and counsel him and find out exactly what's behind it and if it would really be good for his bodily functions. I feel uh, sex drive is an important thing for a person's life force to live, to maintain life. And uh, before doing this, we'd have to, you know, you'd have to counsel a person You'd have for to have a private, a private thing with him to find out how bad it is and where it's at and how it's affecting him. See, I mean, I just couldn't tell him yes or no. But for we, one thing, you know, sex drive is not something separate. You know, it's part of the body. It's part of the it's mind. It's part of a whole set of energies. Mm -hmm. and if you eliminate it, you could be eliminating other things. Have anyone, apart from the panelists, have anyone here experimented with hypnosis? Or, you know, either, you know, working with self-hypnosis possibly or with the hypnotist or hypnosis in any way? Uh, Cal Appleby in this honors colloquium, and again, uh, Trevella has been dealing with the topic, and in the honors call, uh, he has been working with hypnosis in a group way. And this isn't so much, you know, making people walk into the scene and turn into chickens, which is a little far-fetched, but... At least to the level that he's worked with hypnotic induction, I have a little experience with it. And I think one thing people possibly may think about hypnosis is that all of a sudden, bingo, you know, everything is radically different. And at least in the early stages of induction, my own experience has been that hypnosis just involves you with a, a very restful kind of uh, awareness. You're perfectly aware of things going on. It has nothing to do with uh, sudden transcendence and swam. Fire. Yeah, it's uh, now that may be the case in real extreme, extremely deep vault, mm -hmm. but at least two of these things hypnosis is um, something that probably everyone has done riding down the highway, you it's, know, listening to a monotonous conversation. Yep. Well, hypnosis is really the wrong title, and when Dr. Braid back in the 1700s named it hypnosis. You know, hypno means sleep in Greek, that's where he got the word, and it's really a misnomer because you're not asleep. In fact, you become so much more aware of your surroundings and uh, uh, all your senses come alive under hypnosis. I mean, your body is completely relaxed, your conscious mind is diverted to what the hypnotist is saying, and then he injects or takes out of your subconscious mind he works with. Now, if you're one of the rare cases, what they call a somnambulist, well, then you could go into an amnesia effect where you wouldn't remember what went on. And this is where the dangers come in. Hypnosis itself is very therapeutic. It's very relaxing. I don't think it's, it's just like waking up from a long sleep. And you could be only under maybe 20 minutes and you could be suggested that you had an eight hour sleep and uh, you would wake up with just as much energy. So uh, under hypnosis, almost anything is possible relating to your body. I mean, that's how strong they've had cases and tests where they've even stopped the heart beating. He could slow it down, this hypnotist, and there was a doctor with a stethoscope, and listen to that heart slow down and stop. And the guy was in what they call a suspended animation. Remember back in the, oh, the days when there's the traveling carnivals, and these guys used to bury themselves, like Houdini, and uh, those important people that used to bury, and the Indian fakers over in India used to be able to bury themselves for days. And then because they would put themselves that they had such mind control over the body that they could suspend themselves and no life force at all and then bring themselves back after days they, they just do have to admit they found secret tunnels leading out of no no this is this has been uh, this has been uh, like uh, houdini had such mind control he could do this he could hold his breath for minutes and on a time and put himself in such contortions he could get out of these straight jackets just by pure mind control I mean, we all have this power. The thing is, we've been programmed that we haven't. Uh, I, I was wondering if you arrived at all your personal views uh, about religion through hypnosis. Uh, it seems that from the people who have spoken so far, that uh, there has been a general assumption that uh, we are reincarnated. And it seems to me that uh, perhaps uh, we should be cautious of, uh, of, the, of the same wrongs which Christianity often. You, you're I concerned with making a, a past statement. He's I, talking about a pattern, right? Yeah. I'm, Could you I'm explain? having trouble, trouble right now. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what he? Do you understand what he's getting at? Yes. Uh huh. Uh, I would say it's more again programming type. What you're telling us, to me, you're, I mean, 
I learned something new. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's the beginning of a new program to me, whereas Christianity being one of the main philosophies in our particular uh -huh. culture at this particular time. <laughs> so like, is he um, meaning that we are like stressing reincarnation too much and it's against the views of the people here and we shouldn't try and program them for this? I'm not exactly saying that. I'm mm -hmm. not saying no. that, but, but I just feel that uh, you <clears> have to, uh, you, you can't prove hypnosis uh, scientifically really. And, and this, and this is the same thing about religion. I mean, this applies to religion right, too. Right, right, and and it, I, it I, like, like like we're basing too much on this kind of yeah, thinking. That's we're uh -huh. assuming too much. I don't think that this is. Well, maybe I, I should make a statement like for Jack and I that we're not saying reincarnation is true. You can't prove it and you can't disprove it and we don't want to change anybody's opinion because we feel it isn't going to make one heck of a bit of difference in what happens to you when you pass on if you believe in reincarnation or not. I don't think it's necessary to be saved or necessary for anything. We happen to believe it because of the things we've experienced and seen. We've been hypnotized, regressed back, we've picked things up psychically, ESP in many ways. We've uh, had what we've learned. Uh, from many directions, hypnosis and uh, psychic training and in many areas. But we've come to our conclusions, which are our conclusions, and we don't want to thrust our ideas on anyone else. Do you ever doubt uh, uh, your conclusions? Well, we keep open. We don't even say to ourselves reincarnation is true or not true, because right around the corner or tomorrow, we may get another bit of information or insight that will make us feel in another direction. We don't want to say narrow-minded, this is right, this is wrong, this is black, this is white, because who knows? We're exploring. We're open to all new ideas, and there's so many fabulous, fantastic things in the mind, so fantastic, that maybe we'll have a new uh, insight, a new awareness tomorrow that will lead us to believe another direction. So we try to stay open. But the things that we have experienced, or at least the things I have experienced, I'm inclined at this time to believe reincarnation is true. Tomorrow, I might believe another way. I have a constant argument going with Mary about reincarnation because I don't believe it. Or not that firmly, but like I believe in a slightly different situation. So we've had a lot of discussions about this. And, you know, we can still discuss things on the same level using the same terms and it doesn't make any difference because we don't have that firm of belief where just because I don't believe exactly what she does or vice versa there's a clash there is no clash because see anytime you have a firm belief it limits you incoming information will be blocked if it goes against that firm belief so we try to do away with the firm beliefs and then we can take and process all the information that comes to us so if we find something better or more believable more logical or something more proven we can accept that too, but not as a firm thing, not as a definite yes or no. I've got to say too, getting back to the Christianity, uh, history books do state that uh, people, uh, the churches did believe in reincarnation up until the year about 540 it was squashed out. Um, I guess the, the popes, bishops, or what have you, uh, decided this wasn't good for the people to believe. They were thinking, oh, we can raise a little cane here, you know, to, we'll have another life, we'll make up for it. And they just weren't as strict, or they weren't in, the churches weren't in control of the people as well as they wanted to be, according to the history books. And also there was an empress who decided that she didn't like the idea of com ever coming back as anything lesser than what she was now. So she squashed out this idea. Now, according to history books, religious history books, this is uh, what the way it went, that it was taught and just has been squashed out. So for me, when I was speaking on reincarnation, to bring it out into this area, I would say, I believe I am God, you are God, and all other human beings are God. We are God because all things we do determines whether we are happy or sad, heaven or hell if you want to categorize it into that. We are all God, and when we all cannot love no one else until we have loved ourselves. You already when, got it all together. When you <laughs> reach in and love yourself, then you love everybody because everybody is God, and all together we make the big God. The devil and God is one circle, divided in half. One side is the devil and one side is God. God, if he had had the power, he would have destroyed the devil centuries ago. He has not this power because it takes both halves to make a circle to continue heads or tails on a coin.
only through human man in God and everybody living in harmony can we eliminate the devil or the bad because once we love ourselves and then love our fellow human beings then the other half of this circle is just there but it does not exist in our world that's great. Maybe we can talk to you afterwards. You've got some great ideas. Let's get some other opinions. When you say energy levels, according to your own metabolism, sometimes are not necessarily determined by mind. Thinking of the British thermal units. Hmm? That's something I've been thinking about lately. Other than pure feeling, mm -hmm. as and it's in the red, probably in the in the realm of ESP. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of it from my own personal standpoint, like. Depends upon your profession too, um, or to what, what your profession might be. Standing on corners talking to people, you know, which is the, the profession <laughs> text me over there like that. <laughs> That's good. Except you know, what energy level? How many people can you take on at any one time? And yet, you know, you're going to have to sift out who you can help. Because everyone can't help everyone. You don't try to self. That's what I was speaking before. Don't try to, to self. Be, yeah. To be happy. Offer out the hands. Yeah. To be happy yourself, though. Because you know that so many people don't love, and you can't okay. take them all on. Because I want to give you, you a God statement of from one of my, my favorite heroes. Ruth Thomas. And he says, to be enlightened. One must be happy and pleased with himself. He must have a friendly word and a helping hand for his fellow human beings. And when you can do this, you are enlightened, you are saved, and you are God, or you are right. But until you can do all of this, and that covers anything that the human has to make a decision on, you must be pleased and happy with yourself and what you're doing and have a helping hand and a kind word for your fellow human being. Live by that simple statement. Everything is beautiful. It's oh, you kind of believe in the uh, concept of utopia on earth or something like that? I believe in my fellow human being. I have confidence and enough respect in the human being as a person that I do not have to tell anybody what to believe or what to take. Anything that I say, you say, or any other person says, with open minds we shall dissect and lay on this floor. And I would not tell you, him, or any other person what to take because I have enough respect, confidence in the human race that I believe every one of us will pick up the peace that is right. Well, I think you're being too idealistic. Because no, I that's it. <laughs> Why do I know why I just people rebel? That I'm too selfish. Uh, That's you know. it. Why are you selfish? Tell me why you're selfish. Simple question for a question, but you answer me that question, I'll answer it again. No, no, a human being is not selfish. Only when he has been programmed. Okay, you show me an unselfish human being. Show me one that isn't programmed. That's what I mean. Deal with reality. This is reality. Unprogram yourself. Turn back to what you originally was. Kind, considerate, understanding with an open mind. When was I that? Before I was born? Probably was, because you wasn't selfish then. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> but that, that from the no day reality. that you set foot on this earth, mother, brother, sisters, daddy, and all people you have met, has been poking little holes in your card of life, programming you to fit the computer of our society. Yeah, spooks and depression. But this computer does not <clears throat> have to exist. We do not all have to be punch cards to run through this computer. Do you think animals are programmed? Uh, lower animals than we are? Animals? Yeah, do you think they're programmed? They are not programmed unless man has had them and programmed them. Well, you can see uh, um, there a lot of selfishness evident. In what, what is selfish? Uh, where do you see selfishness in an animal that has not felt the programming of a human being? Uh, one animal kills another food. That is the fit will survive 
the unfit will not survive. Well, isn't that true? So and also, only also the best of the home. species will survive there. I mean, to have a greater breed or to have a, a society that runs in harmony, whether it's dog, cat, man. You have to be okay. selfish to survive. The best will survive. The weak shall fall. And until the human person realizes that he himself can raise his own level and be open-minded, considerate, and understanding, then we shall have conflict. But until this, as long as a person is saying, wow, hmm, I'm in this category, you're in that category, then we will have conflict. But a human has to be selfish in order to survive. Why does he have to be selfish? Or because a human is not definitely... What, what is human? Oh, homo what sapiens. Is he homo sapien. Oh, okay, let me, let me say something good. Homo sapien. What is homo a, sapien? It is a grouping of. Uh, By whose dictionary now? Wait a minute, wait a minute now. Let's get down. By okay, whose dictionary? Let me finish, please. In the animal kingdom, there are different different types of animals, whether you classify them or not. And, yeah. and uh, I'll use the word human as a classification. Okay. So everybody knows what I'm talking about. Is different than other animals and is also weaker than most. And if human was not selfish and using his brain and using everything else, he would not survive. Why wouldn't he? Are we still on the occult? Is this a cult? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe afterwards people could ask you questions because you've got a lot to share. But we. Um, accepting the fact that everybody and everything apparently is supposed to process it government responses, the pattern their responses. Uh, in the case of the suicidal, what therapeutic tools do you believe that some of the areas that you require in, what, what tools do you think that things like hypnotism, handwriting, these are often to help individuals sure? cope with suicide, at least those individuals who are suicidal and don't want to suicide, who really want to help people. Mm -hmm. Well, well, hypnotism can be used to find out, uh, I believe, is to delve into the mind and find out why they are suicidal and then try to nudge them back into uh, why they are trying to escape in the first place. See, it's a form of escapism, su suicide. I mean, it's they got so many oppressions on them that they want to get, uh, get out. And I think you find out why and then program, reprogram the subconscious mind to make them, uh, uh, give them a desire to come back. You can do this under hypnosis and find out. You can get them talking about themselves and then you can reprogram. It might take a long time because everybody's different, but I still think it's possible if they're willing. But they have to be willing to want to change. I mean, it's just like anything else. If you want to change, you have to want to bad enough. I mean, you can't take the person that's a sneaky type that wants to go out and I'm going to fool everybody and go because there's no pre-warning. The pre-warning is in the handwriting. The suicidal tendencies do show up in handwriting and if you can get their handwriting and see, oh, oh, this person needs help. If this ever comes into the into where the police and doctors and everybody can say at their handwriting and then have that person picked up on the strength of their handwriting and then put under therapy, then we would have a great big tool. But most of the courts and, and uh, doctors and psychologists, they have yet to put any faith in handwriting analysis that much. Is that scenario that you're involved in? Frank, yeah. yeah. You can why don't talk you get about on the handwriting? That's valuable. Well, I think uh, education, people could be alerted to danger signs in themselves through handwriting before they'd be aware of it. I think a lot of people drift through life kind of in a in a out of touch state anyway and some people can drift into a suicidal state or start drifting towards a suicidal state before they realize it. Um, education through something like handwriting they could be alerted to danger signs of it long before anything would ever take place then could seek help or could find a way to reconstruct what's going on in their life so that they could divert themselves from it. Uh, I if I came in and you analyzed how the handwriting was, I would have that suggestion in my mind, if I didn't think I was when I came in, if something started happening to me, then I just sort of started on the doctor. Yeah, but you see, I wouldn't do that. 
I wouldn't say you're a potential suicidal. That's kind of an insane state. I wouldn't. I wouldn't state anything about suicide. I would suggest that perhaps you're under too much tension in one area or another. And I might ask if you could find some way to alleviate it or suggest a way to alleviate it. Graphal therapy? Graphal therapy is another possibility. Could you tell, like, what area I was under stressing? Yes, easily, easily. Mm -hmm. It also t uh, can show up in handwriting whether you have attempted it previous. It shows up. You start making certain signs in your writing when you have attempted suicide, whether you were uh, uh, just experimenting or trying to get attention, or even if it crossed your mind, it starts to show up in your handwriting. No, How does it show up? What, what do you look for? Yeah. Well, it'd be better not to tell you because I you might start evaluating everybody suicidal. <laughs> Well, it takes a more than one thing. We could say this stroke shows suicidal. Well, other things could make it less or more. And if we showed you a couple of the most serious strokes, you go around and say, hey, you've got it, you've got it. You would know all the many other strokes that would make it better or worse. Right, but there would be some things that would show up for a while. There's, there's yes. constant traits in your handwriting that never change. The mood traits change because your moods are happy and depressed. That changes, or your outgoing or introvert well, changes. Well, the same way, not only with handwriting, but also with just watching people. See, I've, trying, I've got to... I, I wanna, trying to understand them as a human being. I right. help people that, that understand me, and they have a feeling for me, and they can tell me when I'm going in to a belligerent well, or would, hostile or a bad mood sure. well, they're before sensing. it ever signals to me that I'm reaching that point and at the point that they realize it it only takes a minute or two mm -hmm. to pull me back out we get to but ESP when it registers to yes. me a yes. I can't pull myself out yes um, I don't know um, this is just a general question I suppose everybody turn one hand look at their eyes while they raise their hand so I suppose that goes up from what I'm how many here to how many here as suicide at one time or another, you know, been a serious consideration. It's as though you do with saying how far you went. But how many here has suicide seemed like you know, a serious thought? Well, at that rate, uh, I don't think anybody should find lots of lies. Uh, I suspect that probably if we look at it with really open entity, everyone has thought about suicide will. Mm. Don't you feel that you could, you know, go into some general specifics about characteristics? Well, yeah, I want. they publish all these other books like the Lucia Color Test and stuff, and people that probably get to those too, you know, whether or not somebody tells you they think, you know, on the basis of one short reading. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll, um, I, I'd like to say some other statement. I don't know if this is going off the track or not, but uh, something I wanted to get in here. Uh, these people have said they have thought of suicide at one time or another. Was this truly their own thought? Now this gets back to the life and death. Okay, if we drop our body, we're still here. Our mind, our consciousness, our personality, our ball of energy. Some people would call it the soul and the spirit. Okay, here we are. I drop my body, here I am. Now I am invisible. Where am I gonna go? Am I gonna hang around the earth? Or am I going to work my way on up close to the source or halfway up there? Where am I going to be? Okay, at this point, I may be in confusion and hang around the earth. Now maybe I'd killed myself or felt like it and died of some other thing. I have got these thoughts going on yet, I want to die, I want to kill myself, I want to kill myself. I could gravitate towards some living person, I could come up near him, he could pick up my thoughts, ESP, and think they're his own, and think, I want to die, I want to kill myself, I don't know why, I suppose it's because I'm under a lot of pressure or something, I want to kill myself. They may not be his own thoughts, they could be my thoughts, a spirit of a person that once lived. Or maybe I'd kill myself and I'm still going on. I want to kill myself, I want to kill myself or you're, in confusion. Yeah, or you're still in that state of depression mm -hmm. and you want company, too. This yeah. is one of the I reasons. I could encourage him because I want him you to come along over with here me. Too. Yeah. I'd like to know, uh, talking about handwriting analysis and hypnotism, if I wrote something for you, could you tell me something about myself tonight? Maybe we could do that afterwards if we have time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just would like... Or we all do it professionally. Anybody, we do matter. do it professionally if anybody wants it done. You know, we could, you could mail it or we can give you cards or you could write tonight and give it to us. You do do it by mail. Mm -hmm. sure. To me, uh, we were talking you know, about good and bad and right and wrong. It seems like 
you're going to be too judgmental of me if I let you analyze my handwriting. Um, I would. I would. I would, I would not judge. I would say uh, this uh, handwriting reveals these traits, this type of personality, and uh, my personal self would not say, boy, is she rotten, is she terrific, is she this or that. I would lay it out and I would forget it right afterwards. I would not judge you for what you are because you'll see everybody has got like negative and positive. I wouldn't even say good or bad. What's good or bad? something that's causing you trouble, you've got tension, you've got resentment. Uh, I'm sorry for you because I see all this resentment in your handwriting. I might say, but then, okay, this is what you deal with it from there. To me, it image. seems too highly judgmental right away. Uh, me, how I mean, can it be a judging? It's, it's me. well, then, then don't have it done if you're yeah, afraid right. to see what you are you know, your traits. And of course, this is our opinion on what we have learned. In our opinion, it is it is a right thing. Maybe you would think it couldn't be, but it seems to me, um, I mean, handwriting has gone on for many, many years, and to our satisfaction, it's proved because the brain knows what you are, and it sends the messages through the muscles and the nervous system, and you're planting uh, a code right on the paper that we just decode. See, it's no guesswork or fortune telling. This stroke means this, and this stroke means that, see. And this is your brain. This is brain writing more than handwriting, just like a lie detector or what. It's all coming from or any brainwave test is coming from your brain and there it is now my lack of knowledge I could have something wrong and you went to another handwriting analyst they might say something a little different see we're human beings and we could err right. I don't uh, Kent has said that with regard to thoughts I suppose suicide and stress that he'd run away now to what extent do you think that a person can run away whether it's just surely running away, you know, ignoring, or rising above stresses and pressures. The Stoics, I think, said something along the same lines as you rise above things by disassociating your desires. Do you think that's possible in one way or the other? To what degree it's possible? I think so. Now you're saying that if a person has suicidal thoughts, how to overcome this desire? Well, Kent feels that he would run away. That's a well, run away, it, it, what do you mean, mentally, physically, or, or well, you presume, mean escaping? I would presume right there. You mean catching. Yeah. Well, see, it depends on the source of the suicide thoughts. The reason is <clears throat> how to cope with it. Well, he's finding that out. Can I ask a question? Sure. How much trouble do you have overcoming the, I suppose, the stigma you have? Put on handwriting analysis and hypnosis of uh, gypsy fortune tellers behind the curtains to make five bucks and this sort of thing. But this is the thing. How are you going to know what's what's yeah. valid and what yeah. isn't? Is there quite? A, I mean, is it pretty? Is that quite a? I don't think there's much fakery going on, in my opinion, because None. anybody can make a dollar a, an easier way no, I, than faking I mean, through. Maybe, maybe it's not going on, but there's a lot of even in the Boris Karloff kind of movies. And these you mean of, under? Uh, yeah. They, they have put a oh, yeah. bad connotation is on it. Is, that, is there a lot of that, or is that hard to overcome? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. People say, oh, you're a hypnotist. Oh, I don't do yeah. a look in your eyes. You know, it's psychological. It'll be people that'll sit with us all night and look and talk, you know, and then somebody will pop up, hey, they're hypnotists. Oh, my gosh, I thought there was something funny when I looked in your eyes. I knew I felt funny. Yeah. You know, and right away, they're falling over on their face, you know. They're scared to death of us the rest of the night, see. So it's in their own heads, their own minds. Because we do. what do we do? We uh, have learned uh, about people, learned a thing, learned a trade like, like anything else. And uh, But people just take it as a be, being a much more mysterious thing. The minute they're going to look in our eyes, they're going to fall over. Yeah. And it's, it's such a misconception about the, the whole thing. The movies have made it uh, such a big mysterious thing that it really isn't like they, you know, you take the innocent girl and make her commit a crime and then the guy's waiting back at the room, you know, and you can see these old movies and that that is that uh, partly true, but it usually... Uh, uh, doesn't work that way at all. I mean, the mind doesn't work that way because all of a sudden, if she left the uh, vicinity of the hypnotist under hypnosis, he would no longer be there. She All of a sudden, she would come too, you see. Or even if you were suggested a bad suggestion, it would not last. You know, the mind keeps revolving all the time. It's like this is why for people in diet and smoking, they have to go back again and again for recharges because the suggestion has left them. Can you help people stop smoking? Oh, sure, sure. It depends on, uh, you You can make, uh, well, it, it's up to you. I mean, it's how bad you want to quit. I, it, hypnosis is just another tool. It's not a miracle worker, but I can hypnotize you, suggest that cigarettes will taste awful. Okay, 
how deadly do you want a cigarette? Okay, you go through that first barrier of very burnt rubber. The next cigarette's a little less, and then a little less, and pretty soon you'll break it down, and they'll be back to normal again. I've had people where they smoke so hard they throw up because I've suggested that, and they do throw up. They keep smoking. You see? It's bad. <laughs> yeah, right. So the guy finally quit coming to me because he... He, he had an office, and he sat there. He didn't smoke it. He just lit it, you know, and he had his coffee and a cigarette. And so what you got to do is you got to reprogram the mind to do something else besides smoke. Some, uh, if you play the piano, I could suggest every time you want a cigarette, you go play the piano. Or you go you make your cigarettes, keep them outside, up on the roof, in the rain pipe. So every time you need a cigarette, you got to get the ladder out, go up and get, I mean, things like this. you got to use... Uh, all these things to trick people out of smoke. And once you get over three or four weeks, but it depends too. Cigarettes are sometimes better off smoked because uh, if you take that thing away, they might revert to booze, then the drugs, then uh, mental illness because they had such a hang up. So this is what you have to find out in therapy. How bad do they want to quit and how hung up are they? See. So it's another type of program. It's just another tool, that's all. I mean, it's just another. Handwriting is just another tool. We call it graphotherapeutics. Like, say your memory isn't too good. You want to improve your memory. Well, then you practice dotting your eyes. See? Precisely. Dot every eye. Go back and cross your T's precisely. Dot your eyes. You do this often enough, your memory is going to improve. See? Because you're reprogramming your subconscious. It's just another tool. This is the way you change. You want to, uh, you, uh, say you're introvert and you don't talk. All your O's and A's are closed. Well, go, okay, go back and leave a few open. This will start you out as and more talking because the O's and A's are your mouth, if you can consider it. If they're all closed, well, then your mouth is always closed. See, a few have to be open, a few closed. If they're all open, well, then they can't shut you up and you're a compulsive talker then. So, yes? What would be a very really ostentatious manner of handwriting? Uh, uh, just the type of person you are, very ostentatious. See, and you're a big bluff. And the more and the more facade you put on the handwriting, the more bluff you are. See, and really down, you're very insecure underneath if you have to do that. See, that's what that means. Simple capitals, <laughs> printed capitals, are the person that's got it all together that are very secure and, and don't, uh, depending on other things in the handwriting, of course. But that's, uh, of course, you could talk on handwriting all night, but there's a lot that this guy could tell you. He studied it a lot harder than I have. But I mean, uh, uh, there's little, there's little things you can do to help yourself. If you're writing rights downhill, for instance, that means you're in a depressive mood. Write uphill. Make everything go up, because everything up in handwriting is up optimistic, positive. Change your outlook. If your handwriting slants away back to the, to the left, then you're very withdrawn and within yourself. You've stepped on yourself. You've been stepped on emotionally along the line someplace, and your, your emotions are very well hidden. You're very self-oriented. You're all self. So because the left side of the paper is past and self, where the right side is the future and other people. So where does your handwriting Let slant? Let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. What about a person who writes? And as they write a word, half of it will be pointed one way and get go the other. Well, that's a dual personality. See, I mean, he can, right in the middle of a sentence, he can change on you. He can be very friendly, outgoing, and then all of a sudden he can withdraw because he's changeable. The handwriting that goes back and forth is a dual personality. He's very mixed up. He don't know who he is. Well, then straight up and down to me is the best way because then you got it all together. You're not too emotional and you're not too withdrawn. All you got is good judgment. Well, you're you're using your head more than your emotions. You're much better off than the person that. There's a lot of other things to take into consideration. But there's a lot of, there's a, the more you slant to the right, the more impulsive and outgoing you are, and the more you slant back, but see, you got it both. You got them both if you're up and down. I have a question. Okay, while you're analyzing my handwriting, so anybody, you, you talked about some type of therapy sessions or things like this. Do you, you, do you like, have counseling sessions with the person to find out a lot of things about your personality? Or do you take it all from the handwriting? Or what are these, why does it take you so long to find out all this? When you, say, you, when you hypnotize somebody, is this a look loss or work to find out about this person then you hypnotize them? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, I don't know if I understand the process. You're, is you're, that a quick way of solving the problem? Oh.
you're wondering then how we operate. Yeah, I, oh, well now if I take a person for a counseling, first I would have them write, I would watch how they write, I would then spend some time looking at their writing a few minutes, and um, I would evaluate what type of person have I got here, an introvert, extrovert, very deep feeling, somebody that ah, takes things in their stride, I'd look at, at many things. Okay, then I'd say what, is your, what are your problems? Then I go into a thing myself where I pick up psychically, personally, I've had a lot of training in this, and I will, I will um, go through a process to get me into, tuned in, and I will ask questions, and I will get answers to these, and they've proved accurate. I'll say, okay, at what age did this person uh, begin this problem, and this person maybe won't know because it's down in their subconscious, their conscious mind has blocked it out, so I will get age five. Okay, then I'll put the person under hypnosis, I'll take them back in time to age five. Their conscious mind is at rest, their subconscious is exposed and knows all things about them. It's like a computer with everything they ever experienced in there. I will tell that computer, okay, you are now five years old, and it starts operating. Okay, go to the time at age five when this problem first started with this person about such and such and such, and the person will start telling, you know, okay, I, you know, I'm in kindergarten today. Yes, I'm in kindergarten, and I say, okay, what are the kids doing? Or they say, well, I'm playing in the sandbox or something, and, and I can work and find this place and come up with the problem. Okay, then as I see what the problem is, if there's bottled up emotion, anger, hurt or something, I can get the person upset. I can say, oh, you know, that kid did this to you or the teacher did this or your parents or what, you poor kid and so forth, and get them upset and crying and pretty soon they're crying and they're screaming it out and, yes, my mother did this and that and they get all this bottled up emotion out. Okay, now that your emotion is out, your skin will now heal or your nerves will calm or whatever the problem is that resulted from it. Or maybe there's been programming year after year during the life and we have to hit all these different years. I even find going back into past lives, there's programming there. Like with myself, I have had to hit so many years in this life to get rid of why I was programmed to be overweight. I am now working on past lives to get rid of programming. I have many lives where I was programmed and I'm working on it, works well. But there's time. Uh, we're talking yeah. a lot about remembering as a therapeutic tool, and I suppose this is a very Freudian model without validity. Kent wondered a minute ago if that when you die, you forget that you have problems in this life. Whether you die by suicide or if you should just die. What about you? You talked about you know, shedding your body, but you were still in mm -hmm. Are you conscious of what is the nature of you, you know, that you that it members, or if it does or Well, my personal opinion is a matter of freedom or confusion. Now, I feel the people still can have attachments here, remember who their relatives were, and uh, like I might uh, drop my body, and then I feel, oh, I can't leave my children. So I could hang around and be with my children. Now, it depends on if I'm more materialistic more earth-oriented or more God-oriented. Okay, what do I want? If I desire to be up there and release from earthly things, then my desire will help me to go up. If I think, oh, you know, to heck with God and up there, I've got to see what my kids are doing. I've got to control my kids. I've got to run my kids. Or I love money. I love my cars. I love my home. I love the earthly things, you know. Or if you are booze, sex, drugs or something, you're going to hang around the earth then and not go up. So I believe it's your desire. Is it stronger for going up and releasing from the earthly things or the earthly but things themselves? But if, um, do you wonder now when you lose your body, are you going to be all together and normal and great? Fine. Now, to my opinion, someone who would choose any kind of a handicapped situation to come in to this life, they picked a great big problem because then when they lose their body they're going to zoom up higher closer to God. I believe when you study reincarnation the belief is that you picked your situation here. Do you feel that way? Do you feel you chose this to overcome a great handicap? This is the way it seems to me that we picked what we're going to have. I want those parents because then I'll be poor and I'll have this handicap. I want these rich parents because I'll be rich and I have the lesson to learn of being rich. I pick to be crippled. I pick to be mentally retarded. I pick something. And the bigger handicap you've got in the life, you are learning a huge lesson. You are paying a price. And when you drop the body, you go much, much higher. You might say if you pick a big handicap, you're living six lifetimes at once and you're going to go that much higher when you finish. I don't know if that's necessarily a uh, 
Mm -hmm. Well, now this this is the way it, it is to uh, people that believe in reincarnation. I mean, this is the reason. This lady thought some response. Fine. Mm -hmm. like that. Consciously, you couldn't now, but see, this was, in my opinion, your choice before, because uh, we have to learn certain lessons to overcome. Also, there is some thought of what you did in a past life, a maybe injury to someone else or harm to someone else, you pay a price for it. This can be something, too. What? I got hurt by it. So I'm saying in a past life, people that believe in reincarnation believe in what they call a law of karma. If they harmed someone else, then they could have a problem in another life. But my personal belief is that if somebody chose a situation like this, then they're going to go that much higher. They're more spiritually developed. Because don't you feel someone with a problem like this is going to be more aware and more spiritually developed? They have a lot more understanding, a lot more feeling than the average person. Say someone's got a lot of money and cars and health and happiness, they're just, I mean, they're running around. How much are they gonna search for God? They've just got it all here. So who's gonna be better off when they pass over? The person who's been forced to sit and learn and search their own soul and other people? Or the one that's had the money and cars and living it up? Who's better off in the long run? I have a question about I wonder if we're finished with, with her. Did oh, yeah. anything further? Did I? Okay. I'd like to suggest at this point of break, I see some people have left, and what I was thinking is we could perhaps move around if people were interested in going to get involved in other panels. Sure. Uh, I've told some of the other moderators this. Mm-hmm. Just a couple Fine. of Fine. Good.